Hello, I'm Richard Farrow. I'm the CEO of APMG International and welcome to this uh, edition of Midday Mentors. Today I'm delighted to be joined by Jane Judd, the president of the Change Management Institute. Jane, would you like to say a few words about yourself and the Institute? Sure. Well, thank you, first of all, Richard, for inviting me to be um, on your mentoring session today. Uh, my name's Jane Judd and I'm the president of the Change Management Institute. Um, I'm located in New Zealand, uh, so the opposite side of the world from you. So we have time zone challenges to get us together, Richard, and appreciate that. In terms of the Change Management Institute, um, the Change Management Institute has been around for 15 years and is really working towards the constantly building the capability, the connections and the credibility of people that choose to work in the change management field. I understand you, you do an annual trend survey among your members and, and in 2021, so you did a webinar with that and you did the survey. What, what do you think are the three biggest takeaways personally that you saw within that report and for the profession? Yeah, well, look, that's a that's a pretty tough question. There's a lot of content in that report. <laughs> um, but maybe maybe if I think about uh, my favourites, I'll share my favourite takeouts that's from it. That's a nice way to go. Yeah, <laughs> well, because of, there's always discussion around these things, but my favourites would be, I think, the first one um, was really around the uh, Neuro Leadership Institute. They um, they identified the human impact of the pandemic and they said that in 2021 people needed something different um, coming out of the pandemic and they needed more certainty, um, they needed more relatedness, uh, which you know I would say is around empathy and also people would need greater fairness. Um, and so I thought that that was some great insights for change practitioners. We can't really revert to old methods and assume that they'll work. And I think for me that says the human touch is going to matter even more, even if we have to be creative and how we do that. Um, so that was my first one. The second one was around the, um, the volume of change that people can absorb and having the courage to call that out early. If there's too much change, sometimes we have to slow down. So that's the second one for me. And then the third one is really around, um, I think the adaptability of change professionals and us being able to modify our approach to suit the conditions of change. I mean, Richard, you know from your change management courses that you teach, there's a range of models and what we're seeing is it's even more critical that good change practitioners can work with more than one model. So that was that was really my three favourite takeouts from the 2021 trends report. Thank you. Sticking with the change practitioners, do you are your members from a whole range of, if you like, previous professional backgrounds? Because clearly if you are a change practitioner, you are a professional. But do they do you find they come from an engineering background, a financial background, a legal background, or are they simply across the piece? They're people that are sort of enthused and enthusiastic about change and helping people make difference and move forward. Yeah, that's a, that's a good question, um, Richard, because I think if you'd asked me that question five or ten years ago, you would have got a, probably a different answer. But um, what we're seeing now is that the change management pro profession is really, people enter from so many different fields. And so obviously our members see change management as the core of what they do for the, for the most part. But there are other close disciplines. So we see a lot of people come into the change field from say project management or program management. Business analysts um, often do change analytical work on projects and so they sometimes follow the pathway into change. Of course, there's always the human resources um, and organisational development, which was my background, um, into change was from organisational development. We're seeing um, more people head into the change arena from business management where they've been involved in leading change themselves. 
and you want to find out more and work more in this field. Another one that's coming through is seeing more marketing um, <clears throat> analysts and, and communication specialists because of the, the skills, the skills about understanding people and understanding what motivates people and yeah there's there's a lot of similarities um, with the with the marketing field so um, we are seeing more more marketing um, analysts come into the change profession but you know project managers as you know come from everywhere so they come from engineering I yeah I I don't think it's any one source I think it's uh, it's it's a mixture and what brings people together is the fact that they they see the value in the human side of change. I mean that, that that's very interesting because as a profession you you've been growing haven't you as an institute you've been adding yeah. members even through the pandemic. Yeah. So it's. It's fascinating that a professional institu institute can actually add members in, during the pandemic, continue to grow, particularly when there is so much free material, good, bad or indifferent, available on the internet. That you know, the old days when I started my profession as an engineer, you needed to be part of a professional body to get knowledge. Mm -hmm. These days, knowledge or information is everywhere. So what is it that makes these people come to the change management institute to join as a member rather than be a change practitioner you know if you like as a freelancer as, as, as a wild card out in the market what, what's the yeah. attraction of the institute well look i think i think you, you're right it does it does sound counterintuitive um but it, but it has turned out this way. I think, um, you know, we weren't sure what to expect last year through the pandemic. And obviously joining a professional association, um, you know, there's, mem there's membership fees. And, and we just wondered with the situation around the world whether, you know, people would be able to maintain their, their professional memberships as a whole, not just for us. And in fact, we, we found the opposite. We found that on the whole people did. and people were looking for it. Um, and I think that was really around, around several things. It's because people wanted to um, make use of their time. So people that had more time, perhaps because they weren't doing the big commute, <laughs> um, you know, um, perhaps because of flexible, more flexible working, um, people wanted to invest in themselves and join in a professional association where they could stay connected with like people has been important through this period um, and that we knew because our, our webinars, our change chats, all of our connected forums, it wasn't just the membership that was increasing, it was the participation. Hmm. So. It, it was absolutely incredible um, what what happened for us over the last 12 months. But in terms of why, why a professional association as opposed to, I guess, some of the other um, communities that are available, I mean, our members tell us that they value the fact that we're independent, we're methodology agnostic. Um, as you know, we're kind of fiercely independent <laughs> I'm, I'm proud of it. So we're not lying to um, any one thing. And so they like the fact that we're independent, that we provide a, a professional place that's, that's grounded with credibility and deep understanding of our craft of change management. Um, and in the pivot to international and digital formats, it truly worked for them. We we did pivot quickly, and mm. um, and they discovered that this international um, connection is really working. And I guess what we do is we sift through all of the information that's available and share the nuggets of wisdom that we think are most relevant to the profession. So those that um, want that and and want someone to sift for them. Then, um, then that works really well. And we create sessions where people can come for support in their growth without being sold solutions because we're independent. Um, and I guess it's like-minded people sharing 
their challenges and collaborating for the greater good. I mean, our members really like the practical application and tools that our community share with each other. Um, so their own experiences rather than being sold products or services. So yeah, it's been an interesting year and um, been very rewarding. Excellent. Jane, I, I've run a couple of IT projects recently within my own business. And I've now come to the view that an IT project never ends. <laughs> when you've done something, you've always got to do something. So, so the concept of IT and a project with an end date just doesn't resonate with me anymore. You know, you're on to an IT iteration, you're on to IT business as usual. What was your view on a strategic change initiative? Does a strategic change initiative ever end? Or is it one of these things that it's, you get to a certain point in the process and then you feel, you know, you've got to do some more. So, it, so it's, it's a life journey. It's an organization's life journey of strategic change. Or is there an end date when, you know, a member could look back and say, we effected that change, or is it simply more and more granular change or more and more moving into different parts of the business? You know, what is the what is the official definition these days of change? I'm, 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 smiling, I'm smiling because I, I so understand what you're what you're meaning there, Richard. Um, <laughs> I'm also smiling at what I want to say, so so here goes. Um, I'm going to answer yes and no. <laughs> <laughs> you must be a consultant. You must, through your bones and your blood. You well, must be a consultant. It depends. Yeah. I think I think a strategic initiative by definition will have an outcome that should be achieved. So to me, if it's if you're achieving, if you're achieving an outcome, whatever it might be, then it's it's got an end of some kind, you know. So you know that you've achieved it, and so I think there's a yes in there around a strategic initiative will have an outcome, so it can be achievable. I think I think depending on the on the context, there might be a discrete project like a new policy or product, or it might be part of a multi initiative sort of program of work or transformation so i think there are some discrete pieces that yes they do have an endpoint but it could be that each piece will have its own definition of success that marks its completion but one completion of one strategic initiative often leads to another yeah. so i think while organizations evolve and adapt there's always been changed and so building and sourcing capability to support organizations in this is is critical but i think there's a difference between a, a single initiative and then multi initiatives like part of the transformation um hence my yes and no <laughs> does that make sense it does it does it makes a lot of sense you said one of the themes that came from the trend report was too much change people feel that you know we need to slow down the pace of change so that we can actually both cope with it and we can deliver it as we come out of the pandemic and i say as we come out of the pandemic you know the world is starting to to travel a bit more people are getting out people's freedoms are coming coming back what do you think is the major challenge over the next say 18 months or two years as businesses come out of the pandemic and still need to sort of build on maybe working remotely using technology or whatever it is in order to drive forward and make them more capable more resilient if that's the right word of dealing with another impact at some time in the future so this balance of needing to change wanting to change yet we can't change too quickly because the human the human body the people aren't necessarily capable of assimilating that change yeah, look, um, just to clarify in terms of the volume of change, I think, I mean, look at what we've been through in this last 12 months, just the huge volume, the, the, the changes that we've all adapted to is seismic, I think was the word we used in the report. Um, it's huge. And so we are capable, we are capable of significant change. And um, you know, parallel changes, you know, we, some of the, 
really when you think about some of the social, political, health changes of the last 12 months, they've been huge. So I think, I think as humans, we're, we are resilient and we should take, we should take pride in that this year. Um, and we are, I believe we are overall very human and empathetic towards each other. I think we've seen some amazing examples of that over this last 12, this last 12 months. As, as organizations come out of um, the pandemic or when, when countries and businesses do, I think there will be, I think there is already, and we're seeing signs of it here in, in New Zealand, um, there is a heightened awareness of change and how we respond to change. The volume of change issue is, for me, it's, it's not how much change, it's, it's how much can we handle both from a business perspective and a human perspective. The thing we struggle with most as humans is being able to make sense of the change. And so if we want to, from here forward, pick up the pace, I think the challenge is how do we ensure that the ongoing changes make sense to people mm. and they're not viewed as um, discrete um, individual changes, that it is a way that change can evolve um, in bite-sized chunks that we can all assimilate and get on, you know, get on with, so that it doesn't feel like a tidal wave. It's when, if we, if we feel like it's a tidal wave and we can't quite get our head above water, well, it's not going to succeed. So I think there's going to be a greater focus on making sense of change um, going forward, because that certainly that certainly would be my experience through the pandemic. Is what's made some of this so much easier for us is the clear communication, understanding what's expected, all of the things you would expect to see in a good change scenario. Um, so it is possible. We've got examples. It's just how good are we going to be at translating that into our day-to-day -day business practice? And, and, and maybe that's the lesson of the last 12 months. We knew we had to do something. So, yeah, the change, if you like, was not just enforced upon us, clearly the pandemic, but then government started to give certain directions, organisations had to pivot, people needed to work remote. So you could see the logic of the change that, that you had to adapt to. And maybe that will be the challenge as we come out of this. It's, it's organisations explaining the true logic, the rationale to people and people buying into that in order to move forward. Because I think it has been that such an unusual mm -hmm. set of circumstances yeah. that, that yeah. people understood the reason. And that's not necessarily the case when you get the memo down within the business, we're going to make this change or this project's being launched and we hope you all that's support. Right. Very interesting. Jane, I think we've probably run out of time. So. Many thanks, many thanks for joining me today. Um, fascinating insight and a fascinating discussion. And uh, yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. It's been great to be here. Thanks, Richard.